All right. I guess we'll start the lecture again. Ten minutes is over. So here we go. We're going to resume where we left off before the break. We talked about different kinds of exceptions that can happen. This slide asks the question, where do those exceptions happen in the pipeline? Where does arithmetic overflow happen? Is this doing any arithmetic? No. This no? Right here. In the, in the execute stage, we could get an overflow. So it happens in the execute stage. And is it a synchronous exception? Yeah. It's caused by this instruction. How about an undefined instruction? When do we find out that we've got an undefined instruction? Fetching? No. In the decode stage. So in the instruction decode, we find out what's this code? We don't know what to do. We can't do anything with this. It's a bad instruction. It's caused by the instruction, so it's synchronous. What about a translation look-aside buffer or page fault? A little bit hard to give meaning because we haven't studied memory yet. In the next chapter, you'll see these. But these are caused when you go to memory and find out that what you want isn't there. It's on the hard drive. Huh. So that means your instruction caused it, but we're going to have to stop your program and run an I.O. routine in the operating system to bring in something from disk and put it into memory, and then you can try again. All right? So again, that's going to be a synchronous exception. Where do we go to memory? Here and here. So we could have those kind of things happen in the fetch stage or the memory stage. Okay? I.O. service request. Okay? This is where uh, an I.O activity needs to happen and you didn't cause it. Okay? So it's obviously not synchronous. It's, it's an external interrupt. And it could happen anytime. Your instruction could be in any of these, an outside ah, 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 I.O. service request, I.O. service request, stop your processing. We need the CPU right now. Get off. Heidi, Heidi, get, get. It's, it's kind of like a fire alarm at your school. Did, when I was a kid, uh, we loved fire drills and bomb scares and all that because it meant you get to go outside and talk to your friends. And sometimes they happen right in the middle of the lesson. The teacher's teaching math or geography and suddenly, rah, 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 and you know, the first thought through everybody's head is, is this real or just a drill? The second thought is, doesn't matter. We go out. <laughs> so we love those. We love those. And once you're out, it's a very long time to come back in, you know. So we, it usually killed that lesson and sometimes the next lesson. Did you have those when you were in school? Yeah, it's too bad they don't do those in university. <laughs> okay, and then the other thing that can happen is hardware can malfunction. We can just have a problem with some hardware unit. And if that happens, again, it's not your fault. It's external, so it's, it's not synchronous. It's asynchronous, and it can happen anywhere in the pipeline. So you can see that any stage of the pipeline is a candidate, internal, external possibilities, and you should beware that multiple exceptions can happen in any one clock cycle. Multiple exceptions can happen. Watch this. OK, here's five instructions. They're all in the pipeline. This one just fetched, and it caused an instruction reference page fault. This one is decoding, and it found an undefined instruction when it decoded. This one's in the execute stage, and unfortunately, there was an arithmetic overflow. This one is trying to do something in memory, and it caused a data page fault. So we got one, two, three, four exceptions all coming at once. Because four different instructions each cause an exception. Whoa. <laughs> In one clock cycle. OK. Now what has to happen is, as it says down here, the hardware has got to sort out which one to handle first. And the earliest instruction is the one that's going to get the first service. So that would be uh, this one. It's the furthest along. You know, this is the latest instruction. This is the earliest instruction. We saw. In CS223, the exact hardware that will handle this. You remember what it was called? Multiple requests. Choose the one that you're going to do. What do we call that? Not multiplexer. <laughs> no. Close. That's not a bad guess. But it's hardware that does the choosing for you. There's no control signals needed. A multiplexer needed controls to choose. Multiple requests are all coming, hey, I want service, hey, I want service, hey, I want service, hey, I want service. They're all yelling, help me, help me. Which one? The one with highest priority. What was that piece of hardware called? Priority encoder. Remember? Priority encoder. All right? So it gives the code of the one with the highest priority. All right? Okay. So that's how we would handle that in hardware. Okay, now. Let's talk about MIPS specifically, because we're going to make some changes to our data path or our processor to handle exceptions. All right? 
So let's think about it. The first thing is, we said you have to record the cause of the exceptions. We've got several possible causes, don't we? So we need a cause register. And it needs to be, it's a piece of hardware to record the cause of the exception. And there needs to be a signal which says write into it. Okay? And that's going to be cause write. So we've got a new control signal and we've got a new register. Okay? Now, if you look back here, how many different exceptions are there? One, two, three, four, five. But no, wait, this is not caused by our instructions. So by a, caused by our instructions, there's only four different things. These are external. So therefore, a two-bit register would do the job. Siffer, siffer is this. Siffer, beer is this. Beer, siffer is this. Beer, beer is this. Something like that. A small register would do the job. Could be bigger. Okay, the second thing is exception program counter, EPC. That's the place where the program counter of the Yaramaz instruction gets stored because we're just about to change the program counter. New code is going to come in, the Kutarma operation, the Akut people with their dogs and their uniforms and their equipment is going to come in. So the, the PC is about to change radically. If you want to know who was the Yaramaz instruction, you need to store its PC in EPC so you can look at it later and say, by the way, who caused all this problem? Oh, it's him. He, there's his address right there. Okay? So we need an instruction, an exception program counter. And of course, it needs to have a write signal. So one new register, one new write control signal. Okay, and then the exception software is now going to have that address. It could go and find the instruction and then simulate it in software if it wanted to or whatever. Then we need a way to load the PC with the address of the exception handler, which is a whole different section of code. Right? You know, PC, PC plus 4, PC plus 4 plus, you know, offset multiplied by 4. That's all within your code. We need to go somewhere else to the moon and say, run the exception code. So there needs to be a new address put into the PC of the exception handling routine. So we need to expand the MUX that leads into the PC. And we need to put a new input, which is hardwired, which is the address of the code that begins to handle the exceptions. It turns out in MIPS, this is the address for arithmetic overflow um, and a way to flush out the offending instruction and the ones that follow it. Well, we already have that. We know how to flush our pipeline. Our pipeline already has that hardware. So look what happens. The PC is fed by a MUX and the MUX used to have two inputs, but now it's got three. Oh, when there's an exception, then we're going to tell it load that. Okay. So that's going to be my next PC and that means we're going to be fetching from a different part of memory where we run the code. The next thing that we need to be able to do is we need to be able to record the cause of the instruction in a cause register. The next thing we need to be able to do is record the value of the PC in the exception PC. Help me find exception PC. It's supposed to be here somewhere. EPC register. You see it? I don't see it. Under cause? Where? Middle. I'm looking. Ah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Exception PC. Yeah, thank you. I, I looked at this and I missed that. Yeah, so the value of the PC, which as you can see here, plus 4 gets stored, stored. Now we can put it back here. In fact, we could subtract 4 from it here if we wanted and get it back. Or we could store it with plus 4 and then the software could subtract the 4 and then get back. Anyway, we store the Yarama's PC value. We store the cause. We have a way to put in this new thing. And then, of course, we have to have write signals for both of these, which are going to be coming from the hardware when we discover um, the cause of our exception. So the, it, it modified just a little bit here. Notice also we have, um, we have anything else here? IF flush, EX flush, ID flush. Maybe some of these are new too. I don't know. Anyway, they're for flushing you know, the pipeline, putting zeros in as we need to. I think that's all that's new. Okay. So. All right, let's summarize what we've done. This is the summary of all of chapter four. And you can say, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you talk for five hours. That's the summary. It's the main points. If you didn't understand anything about chapter four, then I'll see you next year in this course because <laughs> it's very important. But anyway, at least, at least learn this. Okay, this is the, the bare minimum from chapter four. Let's go through it. The first thing is all modern processors use pipelining. That's why the second project is going to be a pipelining project. What does pipelining give us? CPI of 1. Yeah, we had that with single cycle, Hoja. And what's the big deal? And a fast clock cycle. Ooh, ooh. A fast clock cycle and CPI of 1, not a slow clock cycle. 
Second thing is, the pipeline clock rate can't be any faster than the time delay from one of the pipeline registers to the next pipeline register, which you know, we've gone over many times, is what? Clock to queue plus the combinational delay plus the uh, setup time plus the skew. Remember, there's a bunch of factors, and that limits how fast the clock can go. If you go too fast, you mess up, and the thing you loaded in is just garbage, just chirp, nothing else. So we've got to have a clock that fits the slowest pipeline stage. So they should all be equal. If they're unbalanced, you're going to have some of the calculations which are already there. Hey, I'm ready. What's going on? Why is the clock so slow? And some that are going, <laughs> and they just get there right when the clock locks them in. So we, we have that problem. Uh, we want to equalize. So it says here, the pipeline clock rate is limited by the slowest stage. So designing a balanced pipeline is real important. Third point, which we spent many hours talking about, is you have hazards now. You have to detect and solve them. Got structural hazards, which means you've got to design your pipeline correctly uh, with the right kind of hardware so that you're not asking for the same piece of hardware to be used by two different instructions at the same time. You got data hazards. If you don't fix those right, you're going to stall, and that's going to slow down the CPI. The way to fix is to forward. That means extra hardware for um, forwarding, MUXs and control hardware for forwarding data, and you can't fix them all. We discovered one called the load use hazard on MIPS, and there will be others on more complicated pipelines that just don't fix. So you have data hazards that come from data dependencies in the instructions. And then the control hazards. Those are the ones that we spent a lot of time on and we finished up today. And the control hazards, they put the branch decision hardware as early as possible to reduce the penalty. Um, and if you can't make it go to zero, uh, you have to stall some ways to lower it closer to zero or to predict or to use a delayed decision, which is a reordering of the instructions by the compiler. If you predict, it could be static or dynamic, and we put dynamic in red because that's the good stuff. That's the modern stuff using dynamic prediction in hardware to make intelligent guesses, and we got pretty high rates with that. Um, and then finally, the last thing we talked about here is Pipelining complicates the exception handling. You will have exceptions. It doesn't matter if you have a single cycle or a pipeline machine, but when it's pipeline, it's a lot more complicated to handle the exceptions. And you might get multiple exceptions happening all at the same time. And you've got to make sure that you don't, you, that you don't allow changes in state by instructions which won't be executed because you had an exception. Let me say that again. Let's say that here's an instruction and it causes an exception, but it causes it late. And the next one after it changes state. And so here we go, we're moving along, moving along, and this one says, oh, by the way, I'm changing a value in register or memory. And then, and then this one says, ah, ding, 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 exception. Which means what? Means after me, don't do any of those guys go somewhere else and do something else. Wait a minute, we already did part of what this guy wanted and he changed the state and now you're telling me he's not even a real instruction? He wasn't supposed to execute because we had an exception from you? It's a little bit late. No, it's just as earliest as I learned about it. I, I, I caused it when I was trying to write to memory and I got a page fault. That means these guys don't execute. Wait, it's too late. I changed something. Ah, give it back. Yeah. Exceptions mean that later instructions might not really execute. But if you let them change state before the exception happens, and we've already learned exceptions can happen in every stage of the pipeline, ah, problem. Wouldn't happen with single cycle. So exceptions really complicate pipelining. Now, I'm going to give you some good news. In your project, we're not going to ask you to handle exceptions. We're going to give arithmetic values that don't overflow, opcodes that are always valid, not going to have paging and translation look aside buffer. Hardware is not going to fail. We're not going to have I.O. requests. So you won't have to, any exceptions to have to handle. You will still have branches that need to be speeded up, jumps that need to be speeded up. You'll still have data that has dependencies, and some of those will be load use hazards. Some of them will be data dependency hazards. You'll have all the normal things, but we won't make you do exceptions too. This is what drives the design engineers crazy, especially in deep pipelines. Imagine you had a 15-stage pipeline or an 18-stage pipeline like Intel does. Imagine you were one of the hardware engineers trying to get it to be fast, high performance, with good CPI close to one, and fix all these stalls and hazards. 
you'd have a challenging job on your hands. You'd be earning the big bucks and you'd be going home at night very tired with your brain very tired. These are challenging problems. Now MIPS makes it easy with a five-stage pipe. That's why this book says let's look at MIPS at the undergraduate level. If you take this course at a higher level, we have a course called Computer um, Architecture and then there's graduate courses as well, you'll learn a whole lot more than this. This is just touching the surface, just exposing you some to some of the issues, okay? I don't want you to get too tired here. Uh, I don't want to make it too hard. I want people to understand this is good stuff, but complicated stuff. And usually that's the way it is in life. The good stuff is the hard stuff, but it's worth it. The good stuff is the simple stuff isn't, yeah, so what, you know? But it's the, the challenging things that really lead somewhere very good. So I hope that I've whetted your appetite to look for more. Um, after this course, you're not required to take any more hardware courses. Oh, I'm sorry, I take that back. There's one called microprocessors where you'll um, have a lot of labs and you'll program in the Intel assembly language, uh, a microprocessor. Um, but other than that, you're not required. There are some hardware courses. One of them uh, is a hardware software systems course called Embedded Systems, which I highly recommend, taught by uh, Uluch Saranla. Um, you'll love that course. It's hands-on, it's got labs, got projects, you work in teams, and it uses a lot of I.O. and sensors and things like that. Then there's another one um, taught by um, uh, Oskar, uh, Oshan Osturk, who's the other teacher for this course, called Computer Architecture. Um, and he actually goes on at the graduate level and does multi-core, deep, deep analysis of, of um, systems, including parallel languages, parallel operating systems, and par parallel performance and deep challenges in the multi-core world. But the, that's the graduate course. The one before that is, is just called computer architecture. And you go deep into pipelines, deep into processor architecture, deep into memory system architecture. So these are great. I you know, just can't encourage you enough to try to take some more courses in this hardware area. But I know everybody doesn't love hardware. Some people say, oh, it's so hard. Yeah, that's why it's called hardware. Of course it's hard. But that's the joke. <laughs> you didn't hear that joke before? That's the classic joke. You know why they call hardware hard, don't you? <laughs> you know? That's why it's called hardware. You know, the other stuff is software, easyware, right? And some of my friends, my Hoja friends will say, it's not that easy. Hold on, Hoja. Yeah, I mean, of course, there's challenges in every area. But if you've gotten interested in this stuff, my my encouraging word to you is there's a few more courses you can take. Okay, and I hope you will. I hope you will. Okay, that's all for today. The other good news is we're ending half hour early. Five o'clock, bye-bye. See you on Friday. Thank you.